Welcome to Happy Hour, a Scripps Gone Wild spinoff where we sit down with the folks who help make our reads happen, have a drink, shoot the shit, and see what happens. Uh, with us today, uh, Mr. Drew McWeeny. Drew, thanks for being here. Hey, thank you for having me, Billy Ray. It's really nice to see you, sir. You as well. You as well. Um, you know, uh, we kind of just talk about whatever on this thing. We never know where it's going to go. And sometimes if I get really plastered, who knows where it's going to go. But um, one thing I do want to talk to you about, we do share something in common. And uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but I grew up and my father worked for 40 years in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Awesome. And I grew up 30 minutes from there in Alabama. And so I guess I'm curious, when you were in Chattanooga, what was your theater of choice? Was it Hamilton Place? Was it Northgate? Was it the Bijou? Okay, so when I was there, uh, it was 1979 through about 1985. Uh -huh. So um, the Northgate was definitely one of the theaters that we went to all the time. And then across, and you'll forgive me because it's been a while since I've been back, but sure. Across the freeway from the North Gate, they had built a new mall right when I was getting ready to leave. So, about a, so for about a year, there was another theater over there, a new multiplex. Yep. And that one we went to a bunch. There was, near the mall, there was an old theater that had a two, it was like a two-story theater. There was one upstairs and one downstairs that we went to a ton. And then, of course, the showcase when I lived there was the Chattanooga Choo Choo, their IMAX yeah. theater. yeah. And uh, I saw a lot of stuff on that IMAX screen. I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark there. I saw Return of the Jedi there. I saw Tron there. Wow. Um, that that 70 millimeter screen was a big deal to me. Like any excuse I got to go downtown to eat at Bombs and then to go to the Chattanooga <laughs> IMAX, that was that was a big day. Wow. Uh, how long has it been since you've been back to Chattanooga? Probably since 87. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's changed It has so been much. a while. <laughs> And I would love to go to the Chattanooga Film Festival one year. I think it would be amazing to see what the city's become because my memories of it are, are so specific and so tied to that certain era. Like um, when I moved, it was August of 85. So it was, I moved between Back to the Future and Teen Wolf. That's, <laughs> that's the era of when I was um, leaving Chattanooga. So it, it's been a while, man. I'm sure it's completely different. You know, when I was younger in Chattanooga, it was, you know, it was not the safest city at that point in time. Uh, you, you wouldn't, you just wouldn't go downtown. But then, like, overnight, the moment the aquarium moved in, it was just like a revitalization. As soon as the aquarium hit, it was over. Yeah. Um, and uh, some of that's really sad because a lot of those great places, you know, as what happens with gentrification had gone away. But um, I'm sure it's, it's kind of become its own thing now. I mean, you've got all these you know, yuppies from Nashville coming to Chattanooga every weekend to spend their weekends. Well, it was, you know, the thing when you ask about theater culture, like I, there was so little, the Bijou, which you mentioned was yeah. primarily, um, at that point, I remember my dad taking me to see Red River there. Um, yeah. I remember specific things we went to go see there, some of their very specific programming, but um, you really had to drive. There were not a lot of theater options. And so, um, by the time I got to like early middle school and the beginning of high school, that was just as they were building multiplexes. And I, f I felt like that was the moment it got really exciting. Yeah. And everything there now is an AMC. I'm sure. Every I'm theater sure. is an AMC there. Uh, I was yeah. home back, I think in December, and I went and saw a couple of films in Chattanooga, and it was just like, okay, pick your AMC. They're all the same. <laughs> it's like, whatever. There's no personality to any of the theaters there anymore. Yep. Um, which I guess happens with cities. Um, so um, I'm curious, you know, I, I know you spent those years in Chattanooga, but so when did you, what was the moment for you, if you can recall that far back when it clicked in that you were in love with cinema? Well, by the time I hit Chattanooga, I was already, I think, crazy for movies. Yeah. And um, that era that's the era where I really came into focus as a film fan. Like that was for me, the, the era where I started to assert my tastes. It's where home video really started to happen. So I got to catch up on everything. And my parents were um, invested in one of the very first video stores to open in, we were out towards Udawa. So, yeah. um, but out towards that end of Chattanooga, they were one of the first video stores and the guy named Larry Allen was the one that, that opened it. He was a neighbor of ours. And so they would bring boxes of movies home to process. And whenever anybody wasn't home, 
I would watch whatever was rated R. I didn't care what it was. Like it was, hey, if it's, if it's in the box and it's open and they won't know I watched it, I'm watching a rated R movie. And home video was the first time you had that kind of um, unsupervised access to films. Like there were ways suddenly to see movies and to get those experiences. Before that, everything was a negotiation, man. Every theatrical experience was a carefully staged campaign based on the rating in my house. Yeah. Like, what do I want to see? What can I get away with? And so that era was my favorite. I, I think that's where I fell in love and really went crazy for movies and really started to soak myself in movies. And where did you end up after Chattanooga? I moved to Florida, to Tampa. Oh. And oh. Uh, I was in and I was in Tampa. I was in Florida for high school and college. Yeah. And um uh and that was fun. I you know, that was when I moved to Florida as soon as I got there there was a sign up saying they were building an AMC. There was a duplex in our part of Tampa and that was it, or a two screen theater and that was it. But they said they were building an eight screen theater. And so I applied before I turned 16. They built it and then the day I turned 16, I started and I just lived there at that point. Um, and yeah, for me, Florida was all about working in video stores, working in theaters, starting to actually have more freedom to do those things. Tennessee, Chattanooga was all about just being a kid and soaking in it. And so it's yeah. that perfect era of Spielberg and the early 80s stuff. And man, it, it was the best time to have that be sort of your, you could ride your bikes and be free. And because that's really what I was watching at the theater at the same time. Yeah. How did you, when you were younger, how did you, because now, I mean, you know, people nowadays are so, you know, accustomed to everything being available on the internet. And I, I still, you know, you, you've you got just a few years on me, but even I can remember, you know, the pre-internet days when like, oh, yeah. I, how, when, how, how did you find out about movies? Because for me, it was always, you know, I got, I got Movie Line and Premier Magazine and like I did all of those things. And then, you know, I would get like the Roger Ebert companions and all that stuff. But like, yep. what was your method of, of discovering films? Um, there was a lot less. There was a lot less um, just media to soak in and to learn from. And so um, it's weird. I am now a member of the uh, LA Film Critics Association, LAFCA. And it's the only like organization like that that I've joined or tried to join. And it's because there's such a history with LAFCA. Like the fact that they helped get Brazil released, that they fought for that film when it was basically being destroyed by Universal. The fact that the critics who have been in that organization have meant so much to me over the years. I really, I wanted to join LAFCA. And one of the benefits has been I've gotten to know Leonard Malton, who's a member of the group. And we see him at all the meetings. And it is still surreal to me because Leonard literally was my first film teacher. And it was two books of his from the local Chattanooga library that I would check out over and over. One was a critical study of all the R Gang, Little Rascals movies. And one was a critical study of all the Disney feature animation movies. And just those two things to me were the fact that you could treat something as weird and ephemeral as Little Rascals movies in a scholarly way and treat them and write about them and assess each one. That blew my mind as a kid. The fact that anybody took it serious or that people talked about it or, and then the Disney features had been what I'd been grown, you know, been raised in. Uh, my parents were very much parents who believed in the Church of Disney and they would take you to see every new Disney film. And we lived in Florida before Tennessee and then back to Florida. So we were in Florida when Disney World was just launching and taking, and so we were there constantly. Disney was an ongoing presence. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating to learn from somebody like that and then later be able to meet them. I, I feel like I had to piecemeal my film education. Like it was catalogs for home video when the first video stores opened. I would just get a catalog and then just go through and look at every poster and then try and imagine what that, and then little by little as the stores would actually get those things, see what I could see and see what I could read the back of. And so you would just fill in your knowledge in weird ways. It really wasn't until I was 10 or 12 that I started to find film magazines at all. And for me, Starlog, Fangoria, those were the early ones. Um, and that was an ongoing war in my house. Starlog was allowed. Fangoria was not. Fangoria <laughs> was worse than Penthouse in my house. I think a lot of households suffered from that same. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was a battle sometimes. And I will always be grateful that I got to send my dad a 
issue of Fangoria with one of my monsters on the cover from Masters of Horror and be like, there you go. I want that in your house. Um, because it was such a war back then. And I I had a weird, um, I was a member of a Boy Scout troop uh, out in Ottawa. And one of the things they would do is we did a paper drive where they had a big, like a, basically a small house and everybody from the parish would drive by and drop off all their old newspapers. One of the people in that parish obviously was a subscriber to Variety and had some connection to the entertainment industry because they had both daily and weekly and they would drop off big bundles of it. And whenever we would sort the paper, I would take those bundles and throw them in my dad's car. And I would take them home and read months and months of old Variety and especially like their film market editions and just go through and look at, and that's where I started to pick up language and started to see credits and started to connect those things. I didn't know what I was reading it for. I just was fascinated by it because I knew that it had something to do with the business. Um, Premiere didn't even launch until I was in high school. Like I was yeah. 16, 17 probably. And I remember the first issue on the stand. I remember seeing it, the Dragnet cover with uh, Hanks and Aykroyd. And I remember picking it up, opening it, seeing the format of the magazine and thinking, why aren't there 50 of these? And yeah. yes, I want this every month right now. So... Yeah, I saw the rise of that culture that you're talking about where you had movie line and premiere and all those things to, to digest. Yeah. And that sort of, and you know, me, that sort of paved the way for me in terms of like, you for a very long time wrote for Ain't It Cool News. Yep. And uh, that for me was sort of my first dive into internet film criticism and then just like, you know, movie geekdom in a weird way and I think that was a lot of people's sort of first experience with that because the internet wasn't you know was not old at that no point. it was it I mean there was nothing like it and, it, and one of the reasons that I, I think it happened the way it did is because none of us knew that it was a career or that it was a job or that it was anything that we were doing for other people really it was um for me all of it at the beginning was based on the first day we got our computer online, the first day we actually, because when we moved to Tennessee, my or to California, my writing partner and I, I wrote everything by longhand and then he would type it. And so those were our two drafts. Uh, we would be in the room together. We'd talk it through. I'd write it. Then he would type it. And that I, we had nothing else. So when we finally made the upgrade to a computer in like 95 and got online, the first night I was online, I found uh, Rec Arts movies, current or cult movies, and uh, went and looked at a news group, and there was a debate about whether or not Deckard was an android. And I was like, oh, I'm home. Oh, <laughs> oh, there's freaks online. Okay. And I felt so happy that I, there was someplace. I, that's all it was in the early days. It was not, I, it wasn't a career or meant to be a like all encompassing news site. It was more just literally oh my god i'm excited about something and i have a place to tell somebody yeah yeah no it was it, i mean when you're you know when you're you know me at the time i was in high school i think when that came around and you know there just wasn't anything like that like you know i most of my friends i grew up in a pretty conservative part of alabama and i was into some really weird stuff cinematically so there wasn't really anybody you could share that with yeah but you could just pop on a site like Ain't It Cool News and all of a sudden you're surrounded by all these people who have the exact same interests that you do. Probably even yeah. deeper and weirder. And that was just a weird thing to, to have. I mean, a great thing to have. And I think that I think it kind of paved the way for a lot of cool stuff that we have now. Well, I, I think the, the good evolution of it is there are really wonderful personal film writers out there. A, a ocean of there's an unbelievable number of people out there right now doing what I think is really interesting, good, valid work that really aren't doing it commercially. They're doing it because they love it, because they want to do it. Um, uh, I always uh, point out Bright Wall, Dark Room. I was just about to say that. that. Yeah, they're they're probably my favorite site. Uh, I yeah. I really love what they, how their overall approach um, uh, radiates to everything they do. Like they they just have a hugely human empathetic approach to film and it's in everything they publish i really love that they are independent that they just they are what they are they're not ad driven um and the last thing on their mind is clickbait yeah um i think the worst thing that came out of that early internet culture was the notion that um every uh that that 
every nerd site needs to be a bully pulpit where you're yeah. trying to influence the business and you're going to ch and dude i was guilty of a lot of it and I, I understand why a lot of it exists now but um there's an entitlement that is set in across all of fandom that has made a lot of the internet difficult for me to read i i just don't enjoy it anymore yeah um, it it's gotten, I mean, uh, there have been periods, but I mean, it's certainly gotten toxic in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's the clickbait and the access stuff. Yeah. It's the fact that people are, are worried about being shut out of things. And I, I wish more people would realize that you drive your conversation. There is no one conversation anymore. And the more we all try to be part of the big, conver the main conversation or, or play that game, the more homogenous everything is, the more it's the same, the more there's no point in reading all of it because you're just getting an echo chamber. What's always great is ignore all that shit, and just do your thing and follow what you're interested in, write about what your journey through movies is, and I'll read that every time. Yeah, and what, what's so great about a place like Bright Wall Dark Room is, I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for just great curation, and mm -hmm. they're, they're just the best right now, I think. And you know, when I was, like you said, there's so many voices out there now and so many voices that just weren't existent when I was, you know, when I was younger. Like for me, you know, when I was younger, it was Siskel and Ebert, it was Leonard Malton, it was Gene Shalit. It was like, sure. that, that was it. That was it. I mean, I even went as Gene Shalit for Halloween one year. <laughs> like that's all it was. And yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, because now everybody can find somebody uh, who kind of aligns with their tastes in some degree. For me, it was always Siskel and Ebert. Like, you know, it came on 1030 every Sunday night. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, I would watch the show religiously. Like, oh, I, yeah. that's how I discovered so many amazing movies was through them. Did you have any particular voice? Was it Leonard Mulder or was it someone else that was, guide, that was guiding well, Leonard you was all? Leonard was the first one that I, I think I really understood that you could write about film in a scholarly way. Like, you could do deep dives into single subjects and you could be an expert on one thing and seeing that Leonard was uh, fascinated by the early days of comedy and seeing that his scholarship on like Three Stooges and Little Rascals that always killed me like uh, he very seriously treats ridiculous things and I love that about him um, the critic that did it for me first was Kale yeah and I, I still I, I have for keeps about eight feet that way which is the one that's this big it's the doorstop of almost everything and i'll just take it out once a week and just flip it open and read something and it's less about what the opinion of that film is and more about how she would engage with the movie no two reviews of hers are formatted the same way no two reviews of hers are just synopsis and then go see it or don't go see it i really don't remember many times that she told you do or don't go see something because that wasn't the point of criticism and I soaked up so many of the lessons of what she wrote, which is writing about your personal experience with something will always be stronger than trying to tell somebody what they'll feel about it or what they will think about it or what they should think about it. Um, and the, the filmmaker that was the, the thing that taught me that with her was Brian De Palma. Because De Palma is wildly divisive and should yeah. be. He is not a filmmaker for everybody. He's not an easy filmmaker to like or love. And a lot of his films are masturbatory. They, they are what yeah. they are, you know? Um, but she wrote about them from some, such a rapturous point of view and she loved what he did so much. I read m most of her reviews before I saw his movies. And so I walked in the door with knowing that this person that I liked and respected had this love of these films and I was curious why. And I also knew that just as many people thought he was trash. And so I, I was fascinated. How could this person, this smart person, think this trash person was so good and all these other people didn't? And it taught me to go look for yourself and to go listen for, and uh, there's many people I disagree with her on. I read a lot of her reviews still and I'm like, I don't, I think she's cracked. Like I really think sometimes she, she got high on her own supply. But we all do. Every critic has their blind. Every critic has a filmmaker they love, where their audience goes, "I don't, I don't understand what he's talking about." I watched the movie and I didn't see anything he was saying in his review. We all have those things. That's just a critic, but that's an honest critic. That's a critic who is writing as unfiltered as they can. You're gonna be weird and unpredictable and prickly. And I, she was the one that really started me down that path of criticism being important. Siskel and Ebert were undeniable. Yeah. The biggest thing that ever happened to me in terms of validating me 
um, there were a lot of gatekeepers in this business when I started writing criticism who did their best to shut us out and to marginalize Ain't It Cool and to make us um, those crazy kids on the internet who nobody needs to pay attention to. Roger Ebert, God bless him, embraced us. And when Roger had me come to the Overlook Film Festival as a guest and speak on stage with him, and he introduced me as an expert on anime, and he brought me out and we talked for almost an hour on stage one night. It was an out-of-body experience, man. I, the correspondence with him before that, that was lovely. But that weekend where I, he really treated me as a peer and he put me at a table with Werner Herzog and Chris Christofferson for dinner one night and he would play matchmaker in conversation and then walk away and just let you have these. It was such a turning point for me. And the, the thing that was most fascinating about it is I disagreed with Roger all the time, yeah, constantly. I still disagree with him. I, I have a lot of the old Cisco and Eberts and sneak previews on my uh, Plex server. And I watch them for fun. I'll put them on randomly and I'll just watch yep. an old episode. And um, I am amazed how often I scream at my television at one or the other of them. And I love Gene Siskel. I miss him desperately. I miss Roger Ebert. <laughs> oh my God, when they were wrong. <laughs> oh my God, they were wrong. So, and like watching them on horror films and how, how they would clutch their pearls about what modern horror was. I... I'm fascinated by that because I love these guys and revere them and wildly disagree with their points. So I think that was important is I always, I always saw that as part of the fun of it is the fact that you, you read a critic and will never match up completely. So then yeah. it becomes about the pleasures of, Oh, what do we disagree or agree on? Yeah. So, you know, you've, you've had, you had all of this upbringing with movies and you're getting to do something pretty cool right now. And I'll just go ahead and say, I mean, this is probably a bad way to put this, but 90% of the reason I want to be a father is to just be able to expose my kids to all the things that I fucking love. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's I great. Just, it, yeah. How is that? And what's that been like kind of passing on that sort of love of film to your kids? The, f the first and most important thing that I will say be before I have the rest of the conversation is listen to your children. If they're not into the things you're not that you're into, cool. That's, that's it. Just cool. And don't push it. If they are, holy shit, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> Cause it's the greatest, uh, you know, um, Toshi at this point is 15 now and 15 is where I, the brakes came off for me. I was watching whatever I wanted at 15 and I saw wild stuff at 15 and I have to put that in perspective. Cause I look at Toshi and I still remember holding him when his mother gave birth to him. So I like, I remember this and he's 15 and he's my size and he's uh, watching Clockwork Orange with me. So it's, it is weird. Now I've reached a point now where we're having really adult conversations about movies and he just had his birthday. And for his birthday, uh, we did a whole chunk of movies about how young men are indoctrinated by society and how they are programmed. So we did Fight Club and Clockwork Orange and it was awesome, man. It's so great to now have a have this person who is digesting these movies and then wants to have big conversations about the directors or the, the themes or about, it's terrific. Um, and then the younger, his younger brother, I wasn't sure for a long time if he was gonna have the same feelings about pop culture. What's great is he doesn't. He loves movies, but he loves specific movies. And so it's not this blanket thing like it is with Toshi. With Alan, it's, I have to be more of a sommelier. I have to really know him and figure out what he's going to tune into. And when it hits, it's awesome. Um, so that becomes fun. Then it becomes about what you share and, and why you share it. And I, I really think this is where a lot of parents and a lot of our education system fails. We need to really look at K through 12 media education and talking more about how you digest all of a film. Not just what you hear people say, but what the movie's saying to you, what the movie's point of view is, what it's telling you, what the themes are. Like, it's crazy how little media literacy we push in this country. And I think it's, it's one of the reasons that we have people who can only see movies now in terms of the most literal surface points and who it's a checklist of, does this make sense to me? Does this make sense to me? Is this the way it would be in the real world? That's not exactly correct. It's, 
dude, that's not movies. I don't know what you're watching, but that's it's a bizarre new way of digesting films that I think has been um, taught to younger viewers. And uh, I I don't know. It's uh, it's a little discouraging sometimes um, to to hear the bigger conversations. And I think it's got to come back to when you share media with your kids, talk to them afterwards, talk to them before, think about what you're exposing them to, and then listen to what it does to them. Listen to how it bounces around inside them. My kids will talk about a movie for six months after they see it, if it really lands. And I'm amazed at what sticks from certain films. Um, and it's rarely what you think it's going to be. So listen, like really listen. What would you say has been your biggest disappointment in terms of something that you really wanted them to be into? that they just didn't bite on? Well, I I, I have, here, here's where you will <laughs> screw up more often than anything. You'll do it at the wrong time. And you'll be in a hurry. And you'll be like, I'm pretty sure they're ready for a, I Stand Alone. I'm pretty sure we can go do that now. No, you can't, don't, don't. Um, and I made mistakes with horror films that I paid for for years, years that it set us back uh, because then if it was anything even remotely scary, I had to go through ahead of time and tell them what was going to happen and make sure, and I blew it. So, <laughs> but in terms of um, timing, I really did it wrong with Lawrence of Arabia because it's my favorite movie. It's yeah. my favorite movie. I, I adore the film. I think about the film constantly. I talk about the film as an example, but it's not for them. It's not for them yet. And even now at 15, I think Toshi's not quite there. Like, he did Seven Samurai last year, and it was just right. It was just the right time. We did Lawrence of Arabia two years before that with both of them in the theater, and all they remember is that it had an intermission, and thank God. Um, <laughs> so not good. Not 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 the way I should have done that one. Um, for the most part, though, I think we've, we've done it pretty right. And we just did a weird thing where we spent, before they went back to school, we did a whole film festival. I had to come over. We made badges. Um, they had to have their badge to get into the theater. They, um, we had everything scheduled out. And what it was was movies that they've seen, that I've written about them seeing, that they don't remember at all because it's been so long. Yeah. And it's been long enough in the cycle of them watching movies that when you're 15 and you saw a film when you were eight, it's not in there. It's yeah. just not. And I realized they had all these films that I thought of as part of their references. And I would say something about Beetlejuice and it's blank. I'm like, you don't remember that. Young Frankenstein, nothing. So we just did a week's film festival where we did all films they've seen that they didn't remember. And dude, it was great. It could not have gone any better. And I think now the ones that they really love are permanently etched in there because there's moments of, wait, I remember this image now. Oh no. And th it's the connections now of things coming back to them. Like, To Kill a Mockingbird was terrific with them the second time. They saw it when they were little, because I really wanted the first time they heard that word to be in that movie, so that we could have the conversation afterwards. Um, but, dude, watching To Kill a Mockingbird with them now is amazing. And, you know, as a 15-year-old, Toshi's got a very different moral compass than he did when he was eight or nine and we saw it. So, yeah, it's... Wow. I, it's, it's endlessly fun and the good part is as many movies as i show them i've got a playlist right now on my server of 50 movies that i want to show them and that's just the tip of the eye like i know i'm not going to be done anytime soon yeah well i mean you you'll, you'll go the rest of your life still showing the movies probably yeah, yeah we'll have <laughs> movie nights movie nights with their kids i hope um so i, I want to ask you about something that uh i was as a lot of people were was as i'm sure you were aware that there was an a, a ardent fan base for that sadly went away uh, i think much too soon which was 80s all over yes sir which was uh just the best movie podcast thank um, you i i guess the question is um what do you miss most from that experience and are there ever any discussions about it coming back in any way shape or form um the problem with the the discussions about it coming back is it's a uh a three-person podcast and I, I I really think of it like the you think of a band um, I think for our podcast even though Bobby wasn't on the air Bobby was as big a character on that show as anything I, I love the work he did I think Scott was obviously Scott he is 
the yeah. largest personality and um yeah. and yeah and i and i couldn't have there's no way that show worked without scott there's no way this short show works without bobby there's no way the show works without me and i the three of us can't make it it just doesn't work so yeah. it's just one of those things where i wish we could do it i don't see that it will come back yeah um and i i miss it desperately i miss the fact that i think we were doing something really cool with it i i it goes back to that Leonard Malton thing that I was talking about, where you you focus in on a specific thing and you go, okay, I, this is going to be my thing I'm going to write about. And I'm just going to think about this thing for a little while. And I'm going to get very good at thinking about this thing. Film is so big as a topic that everybody thinks they're an expert. I, I There's plenty of shit I'm still seeing and learning and, and you know watching for the first time. International cinema has always been a weak spot of mine. And as much as I love it, there's volumes of it that I can still catch up on. But the 80s because that era that I lived in Chattanooga and because of the way I, I worked at theaters and video stores and, and that era to me, I know that era stone cold. So even though we're not going to do the podcast, um, I don't think I'm done with the topic. Uh, I've been working on a book and I think the book will scratch the itch of the completest in me. Um, the book is 2,500 reviews, but it's, I, I think it will be, the thing that will finally put that itch to bed for me. And, yeah. I, and I hope for, for people that feel let, feel let down by what we did, just realize that we, if there was any way we could have done it, yeah. but logistically we're in such different places and Bobby has a full-time job and Scott has many things to do. And I have, it's just, it turned untenable because of physicality. So I wish man, yeah. I, and I, it makes me feel so good when people bring it up. I, I love the fact that it, it, it resonated loudly for the brief time it was there. So, um, and I, I, I miss it as much as you guys do. I really do. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a nice moment in time. Yeah. And it, uh, it's one of those, it was also, I don't think, I don't think anybody understood how much work that was. I <laughs> just now finished uh, about a month ago, probably during pandemic. I now have every movie from the eighties. Wow. I have all 2,500 of those movies that I am going to be reviewing for the book and just laying hands on everything that we talked about. Dude, it's not available. It's not out there. It's a nightmare to try and find. And so like even that, even the effort of just doing the research for the show was killing us over the course of doing it. I think we would have had to do it on a different pace if we continued to. It was so much each month. It seemed like, it, it, we, in hindsight now, it seems like that would have been a perfect podcast to launch during quarantine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> as a quarantine project, it would have been pretty great because um, <laughs> I would have just locked myself in and I'd be, you know, throwing pizzas over the wall and I'll keep going until it's over. It's, um, but it is, it's, it's, I love any kind of project like that where you take a set film something and you're just going to go as deep as you can on that thing. And um, I think that's what the best film podcasts are, really. It's people yeah. who have very specialized, very specific points of view that they drill deep on as opposed to being all things to all people. Yeah. I don't think you can be, frankly, in film anymore. And I don't think our pop culture is headed that way. I think niche is, frankly, where it's most rewarding at this point. Find your niche, man. Yeah. You know, you've been a guest, uh, as have I, on a podcast of uh, Screen Drafts. Yeah. Uh, which our buddy Clay Keller runs. And uh, I... You have very specific, I mean, as you should, as a film critic and a film lover, you have very specific opinions on auteurs like John Carpenter, oh, David yeah. Cronenberg. Oh, I'm, yes. Uh, those drafts <laughs> were pretty legendary. I'm curious, like, who are the filmmakers now that are, like, crazy exciting for you? I, I, I get giddy when I see set photos from a new Paul Thomas Anderson movie. I'm so excited that he's in the San Fernando Valley again. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy that Bradley Cooper looks like he's playing John Peters. Uh, <laughs> that, that image of him in the white and yeah. the, the pukas and the, oh my God, it's great. Um, so that makes me really excited. Uh, but it's, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the old lions, it, it gets less exciting the longer they work with yeah. a few exceptions. Like I think Scorsese remains genuinely unpredictable. Um, if David Lynch ever made another narrative feature, dude, I would be there with bells on. Um, but I'm, I'm really at this point hungry for 
the paradigm shift that's happening. I'm hungry for new voices. I am hungry for Hollywood to realize that this is the easy rider moment again. And this time around, it's not going to be about uh, the hippies. It's not going to be about the independent voice. It's going to be about the fact that they genuinely have to make a space now for everyone at the table. And that moment is going to break our business. Great. It's it's broken anyway. It's, It's Our industry is broken. Our industry is at a point where it still thinks it's 1985, even though it is clearly 2030 in terms of where people are, people emotionally are. And the business is very conservative and it's still very slow to respond to things. It, this is going to break it. The pandemic is going to break things. It's going to break theatrical windows. It's going to break the way things are distributed. It's going to break the way access works. It's going to change the landscape. And what comes out the other side can only be better And I think what's exciting is that I don't know who the most exciting filmmakers are going to be in that. I think right now there's a lot of people doing interesting work, but it's all being pushed towards this corporate, even the most interesting filmmakers right now, the question that gets asked as soon as they release their interesting independent movie that is personal and that expresses who they are and introduces them to the world is cool. What Marvel character are they going to do? And I want that to be done. I want that to be over. I'm, so tired of the goal in this business being what Marvel character do you get? Yeah. Um, I just want filmmakers to build their careers again and, and make filmographies of stories that are interesting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something earlier that I want to touch on because uh, I am, like a lot of people, uh, these two films were very important to me when I was younger. And it seems like you might have seen the third installment of this particular film. I might have. Um, as someone who has not seen it yet, but hopes to see it, you know, tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. What can you tell us about your experience with the third part of the most excellent trilogy? I think we're going to find out who really likes Bill and Ted. <laughs> because Didn't I we think... find that out with Bogus Journey? Well, here's the thing. Bogus Journey and Excellent Adventure to me, they're very much of a piece. They are a voice. If you like Bill and Ted, there is a goofy, silly, willingness to be weird, not everything adds up, quality to the Bill and Ted movies that, and they're they're very young. They they are definitely movies that were aimed for younger viewers. I don't think there's any part of the Bill and Ted that is expressly adult. Um, I think people forget that. I think a lot of people have in their head that Bill and Ted is more of a uh, sort of an action-y, back to the future type. It's not really what those movies are. I thought Bill and Ted Face the Music is 100% a Bill and Ted movie. And having said that, I had a great time. I really, I found it sincere. I found it sweet. I think what it ultimately says is like crucial, kind of. But it yeah. says it in a very goofy, silly way. And um, Dean Pariseau, uh who directed Galaxy Quest, yeah. being the director here, I think really helps. Um, It's not an expensive movie. It clearly, they're they're pushing the tech as far as they can with the dollars they have. But he's got a really fun visual style. He knows how to do this stuff. And more importantly, he knows how to make space for comedy in the middle of effects. That's not an easy skill set. How many bad sci-fi comedies are there? Or bad effects-driven comedies where they can't get that balance right? And they either the effects take over and it just becomes an action movie that occasionally people say silly things in, or the comedy completely overwhelms the effects and they don't work. Parasol is really good at the balance here. And I think um, his daughters don't take the movie over, um, but they are a really lovely addition. And I think the, the way they write and play the daughters is exactly right. And it's a tricky thing. I think there's a million wrong calls they could have made with young Bill and Ted. And I think they made the right calls. Good casting. Uh, And dude, if you love Bill and Ted, it's just really lovely to see Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves in 50 different latex setups. They play 50 different versions of themselves. It's great. Like there's a lot of it that you'll really, really enjoy. How noticeable and how much is George Carlin missed? Um... If you love George Carlin, you'll get a little misty when you see what they do. Oh God, I'm already, uh, this is not bode well for me. <laughs> it's, it's nice. It's it's not, they don't overplay it and they don't lean on it too hard and they're not trying to kill you. 
but yeah. it's nice and it lets you know that first and foremost they miss him and they respect him so yeah. um he is definitely he has a presence uh, is it akin to the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull moment where they pan past the photo of the dead Sean Connery? Thank God, no. Thank God, <laughs> no. It's uh, it's much better handled, and they don't drive into a statue of him and cut his head off. So uh, it's <laughs> yes. it's good. Uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, and that's the thing is it really respects the legacy of Bill and Ted. Down to if you if you love these movies, there are jokes that each movie makes and builds on. Like you want to know where Missy is, you will. And it's yeah. awesome. And it's like that kind of thing to me really pays off. It is clear that it's Chris and Ed writing that nobody else came in and took these characters over, that it's the guys who created them, who have carried them around all these years and who still love them, who wrote this because it it's 100% them. Yeah. Um, I've got one final question for you, sir. Sure. Um, and I want you to pull from every film you've ever seen. <laughs> so it's an Thanks. easy question. So three films that people probably don't know of that they should check out. Mm. Three films they probably don't know of that they should check out. Yeah. All right. Some curation here. All right. One of them I just recently rewatched and I bring it up from time to time and I bring it up because it's got two actors you love and an actor who we all should love giving a performance that just doesn't stop. Orphans by Alan J. Pecula from 1987. Uh, Matthew Modine and Albert Finney and Kevin J. Anderson. And uh, Kevin Anderson in the film is the little brother to Matthew Modine. They're street kids. They've lived their whole yeah. lives on the street. They basically have nobody. And they get this big idea when they find a guy who's been knocked out. They realize he's rich. They take him to their home. They're going to keep him and demand money from him. They don't understand that this guy is a powerful gangster who immediately recognizes what they are, but also recognizes that they're broken. Yeah. And it is a character piece about the power struggle in the house between these three people. And it breaks my heart. It's and the it's, greatest. It's a great stage play too. I've seen it on yeah. stage and I've never seen the film. Oh my God. It, yeah. You know what a great piece it is, but you know, Finney kills in it. Finney owns yeah. that movie. He comes yeah. in and he, he like, he's so great at the dynamic of how to handle both boys, but it's Anderson. Yeah. You know, in like in of mice and men, Lenny's the character. If you're an actor, you want to play Lenny. Cause Holy shit, it's heartbreaking. And it's great in orphans. It's the younger brother. And my God, he's good in it. Um, that's one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would go with the Jodie Foster film, Five Corners. Oh, don't know that one either. People love John Patrick Shanley, rightfully. Yeah. yeah. Um, Moonstruck, beloved when it came out, still beloved. Joe vs. Volcano, not beloved when it came out. I think heading towards beloved now. I think yeah. the, the cult, we've finally gotten it over that hump. I used to say Joe vs. Mm. Volcano when asked this kind of question. Yeah. But I think now people know that one. Joe's kind of moved into the canon somewhat. So let's do Five Corners, which is his movie from the 80s that he wrote and directed. Five Corners is uh, John Turturro, Tim Robbins, Jodie Foster. It is a neighborhood movie. It reminds me a lot of Moonstruck in terms of the texture of the character work, but it's about a girl who is afraid of somebody who left her neighborhood for a while and has returned and the guy who steps up to help her. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Phenomenal character writing great work and it's one of those movies that i i wish when we talk about jodie foster and how great an actor she is i wish this was right up there next to silence and contact yeah. and some of the later ones that we know so well um it's a really amazing piece of work uh and then god last one um well it, i don't hear people talk about it enough nancy savoka's dogfight oh yeah i know that one yeah um, Nancy Savoka's Dogfight, Lily Taylor, River Phoenix, beautiful little movie. And uh, it's the movie I always think of when I wonder what River would have done had he lived. I think that movie embodies so much of what I think he could have been as an adult leading man. And you start to really see him there as a man, not as the young man he was for so many of his films. Yeah. And um, that, that's another one, too, that was turned into actually a pretty terrific stage musical. 
Yeah, yeah, and I know, and it's weird because I some of these things like they have afterlives, but I still don't think people know the original movie. And Warner doesn't make it easily available. It's not one of those that's out there that you can see on every service. You got to track it down. But Dogfight's worth it, man. Heartbreaker. Yeah, I can echo that one. That one's a pretty terrific film. Um, well, though, that's three delightful films that folks can check out. All right, man. Um, thank you, sir, for sitting down with us and and thank chatting you. with us. And uh, last I, one. Here we go. I didn't get plastered, but uh, uh, well, let me give the folks a little bit of a, so if you want to, um, so this will be on our Patreon and then on our YouTube. Uh, our next read after this drops will be The Burbs on September 9th. Uh, awesome. So join us for that. Uh, we just dropped our Fright Night read onto the YouTube with, uh, we've got Tom Holland and Jonathan Stark dropped in for a quick chat for that. So you can check that on That's our awesome. YouTube. And uh, yeah, got a lot of full, con, uh, blah, blah, blah. got a lot of fun stuff coming up on the rise. You can go to scriptsgonewild.com. Check us out on the socials at Scripts Gone Wild. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Scripts Gone Wild. And thank you to Drew McWeeny for being with us. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. 